That's never happened before. I walk in a room, everybody got silent. Did I do something wrong? <laughs> so welcome. So good afternoon and welcome everybody. I'm Talmadge King. I'm the Dean of the UCSF School of Medicine and it's a, indeed a, a pleasure to continue this celebration. We started yesterday and uh, through the evening and now uh, here we are again today. Um, we are here to celebrate the establishment of the Brenda and Jeffrey Kang Kong Presidential Chair in Healthcare Financing, honoring Joanne Spetz. Um, so, a warm welcome to everybody, uh, especially to the Kang family. I'm thrilled with this opportunity to celebrate with uh, with Dr. Spetz of her achievements. The School of Medicine. Um, very much values endowments. Um, our tradition of endowments go back many, many years. Actually, I think the first was in the 1930s. And uh, it's a way for the for great institutions to provide a consistent source of foreign, uh, funding for our premier talent. Today, UCSF has about 450 endowed positions. It turns out that's more than our tenured positions from the state. And so we very much depend on this as a way to support our faculty. Holding an endowed chair is a great honor in, in the academic world. In fact, it's probably one of the highest distinctions a university can convey. It recognizes the individual's accomplishments and the promise of their work. So here at UCSF, we pride ourselves in being a collaborative environment, and we feel that nowhere, no place at UCSF can you go where you don't find brilliant minds who are working together, pushing the boundaries of our present knowledge. And we're really, really proud of, the, of UCSF Philip R. Lee Institute for Health Policy Studies because that is one of the places where collaboration meets brilliant minds, and we have actually done some outstanding things. And it was so enjoyable last night to listen to young and old talk about what's going on in the, in the Institute, and I am so proud of it. Uh, I'm sure that if Phil were, were here, he would probably say this is even more than he even imagined, and he had a great imagination. Um, so I, with that, I would like to introduce Dr. Claire Brendis, Distinguished Professor and Director Emerita of the uh, UCSF Bill R. Lee Institute for Health Policy Studies, who will speak about Dr. Spetz and her achievements and contributions. So Claire, thank you very much for doing this. It's such a treat to be with all of you, and I have to say that I'll speak a little bit personally about how much this chair means before introducing to you the very first owner of the chair. Um, and a few, uh, several years ago, now two or three years ago, the development office here approached me about the fact that there may be someone who may be interested in funding something, a gift, uh, with you know a very lovely couple. And on top of that, they also had a daughter who was studying here. But it really wasn't because of the daughter, but it was because <coughs> Jeff had been a medical student here, and he was one of our graduates in 1981. And that he then has had an amazing career in healthcare financing, in establishing a number of different programs nationally. So I have to say that when uh, the appointment was set up, I was a little nervous. But within a few minutes, Jeff put me at ease completely, because he really speaks from his heart. And while people say, healthcare financing, you know, how does that deal with social determinants of health and equity and access to care? And Jeff, that is his philosophy. His philosophy is how do we create more effective systems of care that enable a greater equity of access and quality of care? Another uh, umbilical cord that connected us, because definitely he represents the DNA of this fantastic institution at UCSF and our alumni of our medical school, is the fact that he knew Phil Lee at uh, the Department of Health and Human Services. 
And in fact, not only does he know or did he know Phil and worked with him around healthcare financing, but he also worked closely with Peter Lee, who we are graced to have here, who, as many of you know, is the nephew of Phil Lee, but apart from being the nephew, he helped to design, visualize Covered California, which is one of the most successful programs in healthcare financing and really the beacon for this country. So as Jeff and I started getting acquainted, Brenda had just had some surgery on her knee, and you know we came and spoke with her as well. But it was clear that there was a spark. And the fact that Jeff really shared with me that his vision was that the Institute expand its work in healthcare financing. And as many of you know, and uh, we were very happy that Talmadge was with us last night, along with the Chancellor Hawgood and the Vice Chancellor Dan Lowenstein, the Institute has had a long history, a 50-year history, of a commitment to multidisciplinary research around all the issues that interfere with people's access to care, but as well as economics, as well as effective interventions that work successfully for different people. So I felt that there was a weaving together of the strands of Jeff's career, Brenda's support, because we know that um, behind every successful man is sometimes people say, tease me with my husband saying it's a surprise wife. But I don't think there's any surprise with, <laughs> there's no surprises for Brenda. So I wanted to say that the research that the Institute has been engaged in is very much in concert with Jeff's interest in long-term care, in financial strategies for improving healthcare delivery, team-focused care, and different approaches to a variety of workforce issues. Um, so I think that that led us to successfully have this chair. The chancellor was very kind about finding a way of leaving, leveraging the resources. And so now today, it's really my pleasure to introduce to you the first chair owner, who is Dr. Joanne Spetz. As many of you know, she's the fourth director of the Institute. And she was not only a star before coming to UCSF about 21 years ago, she has training in health economics, and her career has been very much aligned with Jeff's career around issues of workforce, around the issues of financing, around the issues of how do we improve the quality, access, and ameliorate the many, many disparities that exist. She's published more than 160 peer-reviewed journal articles, more than 200 policy-focused briefs and reports. She's received many, many honors, including becoming an honorary fellow of the American Academy of Nursing. And I want to say on a personal note, it's so rewarding to have Joanne lead the institute. That means so much to me. And to see how she is enabling the institute to thrive and grow and fulfill not only my own vision, but Phil Lee's vision and Hal Luss' vision. And there's no challenge in terms of um, the relationship between transitions of power at the Institute for Health Policy Studies. We're just thrilled that you are the first honorary chair. So welcome. You know, I'm not Joanne, but we're gonna, we did a, we did a little change up here, if, if that's okay. Largely because Joanne, I've gotten to know her for the last, in the last 48 hours really well during the, and uh, uh, she's always gotta have the last word. So she's got, so anyway. Um, Brenda, did you want to make yes. a few comments? I just have a few words. I usually let him do all the talking because that's what he loves to do. <laughs> so I feel especially fortunate to be in this position to support IHPS with this presidential chair. I thank everyone in this room, most especially Dr. Brenda, Dr. Spetz, Dr. King, and the board. I'm so pleased that my Bay Area family, who many, many of you have met here, um, has been able to come. My brother, David Lee, my sisters, Nancy and Betty Lee, my, and some of their children, 
my stepbrother Hamilton Fong, and from Miami, Florida, my mother's first cousin, Joe Chi. <laughs> It's a real family event here. Most of all, I want to thank the people that are no longer with us today. Were it not for them, we would not be in this distinguished position. Jeffrey's parents, Chi Long Kang, and his mother, Chi Chen Chu. My parents, Chao Wing Li, and my mother, uh, Chiu Har Chi. Our parents would be so proud. This is a legacy that represents all of us. Those that have followed Jeff's career will also know that we have moved many times over the years and have had to settle in places where we start over anew without friends and family. That experience has motivated me to look outward to the community and in doing so recognize how important that it is that a strong community uh, is one that benefits not just ourselves, but um, not just ourselves, but everyone in it. The community is my friend, my family, and over the years, I've made it my mission to support it. Um, it is incumbent upon us to support and nurture all aspects of it, um, and not the least of which healthcare is an integral part of it. Um, the work and research afforded by IHPS can only benefit our society as a whole, and I enthusiastically look forward to seeing its impact. Thank you. <laughs> um, I'll try to keep this quick, but uh, thanks, Brenda. I was uh, maybe I would. All I want to do is share kind of two things here. Uh, why did we decide to do UCSF, and why did we decide to do the uh, Institute of Healthcare Policy within the UAC, uh, UCSF and healthcare financing? You know, so as. Um, Claire mentioned, uh, I, I did graduate from medical school here, um, but you know, I, I actually am alum of other higher institutions of training, um, uh, but this is the institute that I decided, or the school that I decided to first uh, make a donation to. And the reason why was my, my um, early experiences, this, I was here in the 70s and 80s, uh, from my growth were probably the most memorable uh, and unique and rewarding. You know, even back then, this institution, this was before Talmadge started, uh, I felt that UCSF was really rooted in serving the community um, and the, uh, and the dis disadvantaged and minorities. And that was really a set of values that I, was very important to me. I actually did all my clinical rotations at San Francisco General. All of you who've worked in it, that's really where a lot of the inner city care and uncompensated care is occurring. Uh, Steve Schroeder, who couldn't be here tonight, uh, was my mentor in general internal medicine. Uh, and I actually, uh, the school was really good at supporting my extracurricular interests. Um, for example, one of the things that I was one of the original founders when I was here, of the Bay Area Asian Health Alliance, which actually got all of the Asian community services within Oakland and San Francisco together. Um, the uh, other thing I did was I did get my master's in public health at the school uh, Berkeley across the uh, way, but one of the things we, that, that I did there was uh, we had a, um, it was called the Tenderloin Senior Housing Project, and it was all about the social determinants of health and getting housing, affordable housing to the seniors living in, te in the Tenderloin. That program, I went on the website, that program still exists. So this was back in the 70s and 80s. But it was really, UCSF was really supportive. And it really was shared the values that I had in terms of uh, helping the disadvantaged and reducing racial disparities. And so it was really a clear cut choice for me is that if I was gonna make a donation, this is the institution that I'd wanna do it. So then the second question really was, why the Institute of Health Policy um, and why healthcare financing? You know, as Claire mentioned, I was, we talked to the development office um, and you know, they usually do their, well, why not cardiology, you know, because we got this great proton beam, radiation, whatever thing going on or whatever it is. Um, and, you know, it was interesting. I, I, I have to give you a little context here. Um, my entire family is actually in healthcare. Uh, my son, my oldest son, Madison, is here. He's actually a software engineer for Vita Health, 
which is located here in the Bay Area. Um, it's an online kind of behavioral health coaching platform. My second son, who's not here, is a data scientist at Welby Senior Medical. It's the organization I run. And then Eleanor, who's back here, is a rising fourth year medical student at UCSF. Uh, so, um, uh, and Talmadge, make sure she graduates. So, <laughs> but anyway, uh, you know, I'm, I'm really proud of my family uh, in that we've chosen to be in healthcare because, from my vantage point, healthcare, I think, is one of the most noblest of professions. It's, you know, it's about helping people lead a healthy and meaningful life. But what was interesting, and now I'll get to why the Institute of Health Policy, we'd be sitting around the dinner table, all my children are in healthcare, and they would ask me, Dad, this is screwed up. Why are we doing this? Or, you know, why, why isn't this happening? You know, and how come there's so much variation in healthcare? And how come there's so much disparities? And, you know, the answer came down to, if you really want to understand medicine and why it works and why it doesn't work, is you just got to follow the money at the end of the day. And Joanna and I have talked about it. You have to follow the money. And that's the unfortunate part of this society. But it really is, at the end of the day, if you want to do meaningful change in the United States, it's all about health care financing. It's, it's what we pay for, who we cover, how we pay for it. Um, and there's a reason, just some of you know, I, I actually did work at CMS. But for the first half of um, Medicare and Medicaid's history, it was called the Health Care Financing Administration. Remember that? It was called HICFA. Mm -hmm. And there was a reason for that. It's because it's all about how we pay for and finance care. So with that, um, I'm really proud. Uh, I decided that it had to be the Institute of Health Policy, because at the end of the day, it's about federal policy and state policy and, and how, we, how we pay and who we cover. And, uh, it, uh, and I felt that it was really important to have a chair here um, focused on healthcare financing. And my sincerest hope, I told Claire and Joanne both this, that, you know, they get to choose, uh, you have the pure academic freedom, and you get to choose what you want to research. Mm -hmm. But my sincerest hopes is that, the, that you, your team, and the Institute will shed light on what's wrong with our healthcare financing and how to make it better so that we can truly achieve affordable and equitable care in this country. So thank you very much, and Joanne, congratulations on the chair. All right, thank you, everybody, for being here. And thank you, um, Brenda and Jeff, for your generosity to the Institute and for the honor of having the opportunity to be involved in this, to Claire and the other people on the search committee that made the appointed me or recommended to the dean that I be appointed, whatever. The, I'm still learning these processes. Um, so just about the time I figure it out, then we'll need a new director for the Institute. I imagine Claire felt that way. Oh, I figured it out. Time to move on. Um, so thank you so much. I've been very fortunate to have Claire's um, mentorship and her guidance and you know the fact that the Institute has been a strong organization for 50 years meant becoming director of the Institute, which happened after I became the chair, has not been a cleanup job. It's like building on a platform of strength. Whereas I have colleagues and friends who have gone to academic appointments and they're like, oh my gosh, it's a mess. It's you know financially insolvent, all of these terrible things. And it's like, wow, we're really blessed that we have a strong organization. And Brenda and Jeff supporting that organization is, has been fabulous because um, Jeff is on the National Advisory Board too. So I was encouraged to talk a little bit about my work and how I ended up doing what I'm doing. Um, and I don't love to like talk too long, although I can. We get along really well. Um, but um, so I'll, I'll tell my origin story a little bit. Um, my mom is a nurse. 
And my dad was a probation officer with a master's in social counseling. He really wanted, um, in the 70s, his vision was rehabilitative approaches for young youth who were just as involved. He became pretty cynical over his career, as you can imagine, working in that system, one would do, given all of the um, incentives to not rehabilitate in that field. But um, they were incredibly supportive of everything I wanted to do. and. Um, and but they didn't really quite imagine that I would end up getting a PhD. I think I think I surprised them on that. Um, so in high school, I grew up in Bakersfield, California. It was a much smaller city then, um, much less diverse city then, very segregated, um, but you know, but a nice community in many ways. And I had the opportunity to have a English teacher who inspired me about the idea of teaching and service being a way to have a lasting impact on the world. Um, and she was an older single woman who'd never married, never had kids, but she had this daily impact on people. And that kind of at that high school age when you're thinking philosophically, what do I want to do with my life? Having an impact got in my head thanks to her. Um, and then I did speech and debate and policy debate. And if anybody knows about this, you have these national resolutions that you learn all about. And we had topics like water quality and unemployment and how do you employ people who are living in poverty. And um, I think there was one year on immigration policies. And so we'd get deeply immersed in all these policies that I just thought were super fascinating. And we always were quoting economists. So I decided if I wanted to learn how to do this, how to make smart policy, clearly economics must be the way to do this. And so I ended up going to college and majoring in economics and going straight through to graduate school. And the first year of graduate school is like theoretical math. It's like economists, PhDs, want to be baby physicists. It was terrible. I hated it. I almost dropped out. Um, and then I started working with this guy, Victor Fuchs, who is a health economist. He's kind of the grandfather of health economics. He's in his 90s, and he's still writing. Um, I haven't seen him in a few years because of COVID, but he um, was the kindest mentor he would kick my butt on my papers. But the first time he critiqued me, he said, when I critique your work, I'm critiquing your work, but not your potential as a scholar. And then he went at it. <laughs> so, um, but he was always encouraging of me as a person and as a scholar, even no matter how critical he would be about the way I was approaching a question or not being rigorous enough, or does that question really matter? Why, why do you even care? So he was fabulous. Um, I spent a few years at the Public Policy Institute of California and then got recruited into this place by um, Kevin Grumbach, who is the chair of family medicine. And um, also, I know, mentored a few other people in this room. And he kind of dragged me in when he was, I think, an assistant professor still. And I started working with him, um, had quite a long time collaborating with him. And then somewhere in there, the institute, after Claire had been promoted, um, I was in nursing mostly, and the institute was searching for one or more health economists, and I was one that joined um, the institute, which was like moving to the biggest, most fun sandbox ever. Um, so I was, I've always been grateful to Claire for that opportunity, for the people who were on that search committee who kind of called me and said, Joanne, you should apply for this. Come on, move downstairs. We're good down here. And so that um, really was exciting. So the work that I do has mostly been around the health workforce. And I got into that because my fields were labor economics and public finance, which is follow the money. And healthcare is not delivered by robots. It's delivered by human beings who interact even with technology, even with new devices and pharmaceutical and everything else. It's human beings that deliver healthcare whether that is a home care aide who is taking care of your loved disabled elder in your family, or whether it is the neurosurgeon who is doing stuff that's like way above my knowledge base. Um, all of it is above my knowledge base. This is a broad range of workers. And um, if you follow the money, the incentives that they face impact what they do, who gets the job, who's being covered, who's doing what kind of work. And in the end, how, what, who gets what care, how much does it cost them, what is the equity, what are the problems in the system. And so I've kind of kept that lens, but 
you know, working, I've had the opportunity to work with people in a whole bunch of different fields, basically kind of healthcare from birth to death, literally, and um, work with a lot of really amazing people. And, and that has been um, fabulous. So the endowed chair has been a great opportunity to provide me with protected time to kind of play in some other areas. And one of the areas, I mean, really the area that I've been most focused on is thinking about teaching and supporting and championing the next generation. So it's like, what do you do with an endowed chair? You have protected time. What do you do with that? Um, so I'll just give a couple of examples. Um, one was a uh, person I know at Florida State who is a geriatrician, Paul Katz. You might know Paul. No, you don't. Uh, you know everybody. You don't know Paul? <laughs> you need to know Paul. Um, he's fantastic. And he knew several early stage researchers doing geriatric oriented long-term care stuff. And he said, hey, we're writing an introductory article that we're going to submit to the special call of a journal around the future of geriatrics care. And it's going to be all around the health workforce that we need and how the money doesn't align for that need. And so the lead authors of that were all assistant professors. And you know, it was like, this is an unfunded project. These things take a ton of time. And it, there was nothing cooler than seeing the assistant professors be at the top of the article. And a couple of them have recently reached out to me about whether I would mentor them as they're developing a new research grant. And I'm like, of course I will, right? We don't, there's no money in helping people write grants. But these are really talented people. So of course I'm going to help them. I think they're great. Um, the other thing that my husband thinks I'm insane to have agreed to do is I got approached about um, joining the authorship team of a health economics textbook. And um, for those who don't know, economics is like not that many women still. And so this will be one of the first economics textbooks in the healthcare economics space that will have a co-author that is female. And that's something that I can create the time to do from, um, from this endowed chair. So again, my husband's like, and what time do you have? And I'm like, no, 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 this is important. It's, and, and, the, and it's a textbook that's also used in Europe, where they have kind of a somewhat more rationally financed set of healthcare systems. So it's kind of having to write to across international audiences, which will be really interesting and a learning experience. And I'm hoping then to help find the next team of authors that we can hand it off to you know, for, for the next edition after that. Um, so, you know, the, and it, I, we could talk about technical expert, you know, like kind of technical assistance. The state's doing a lot of work around health care workforce issues to help support that. We got phone calls around surge planning for the health workforce. Some of the early stage work of that was totally unfunded, but of course we're all going to do what we can do. And just being able to carve out the time makes a big difference. Um, so, I, you know, I'll say personally, one of the high points of this chair has been meeting Jeff and Brenda. The first, I mean, this was all COVID, so we met on Zoom. And um, when I learned more about Jeff's professional background, I had this feeling of like, why did we never run into each other before? He has worked with many of the same people in some of the long-term care workforce work that I do that I collaborate with regularly. We've got like two people on my advisory committee for our workforce center um, that focuses on long-term care that he has known for decades. Um, you know, just various touch points. Um, some of the work I've done on advocacy for advanced practice nurses to have broader practice authority is a core component really of the business model of Wellbe is nurse practitioner led care. So there are all of these different personal kind of professional touch points where it's just like, how come we never met before? And it, it's always fun just to catch up and get ideas and hear about how the business is going and think about what are the policies that we can inform that can improve thoughtful business strategies, policy strategies to make healthcare more equitable, more available. And I mean, in many cases with the current endeavor for his work and a lot of my work, how do we take care of older populations who have increasing needs for care, because that's going to be one of the major challenges for our country. So thank you for the opportunity and what this has enabled me to try to pass to the next generation, because that's really, in my mind, what this whole body of work is about. So thank you. Thank you all very much. That was inspiring. 
I didn't know all of this before we hired you as a director. <laughs> <laughs> I, think that's, I think that's good. Um, so thank you so much, Joanne, and congratulations on receiving this. Um, so Jeff and Brenda, thank you so much for um, making this um, contribution to the support UCSF and the work of the Institute. We really appreciate it. It's um, very valuable to us. And thank you for being a part continued part of the family helping us so I, I got to know Jeff from my brief time on the NCQA and it's interesting so you sit there so I was a ringer on that board of directors you know like I was a pulmonologist sitting there knowing nothing about finance you know doctors don't know anything about it so just a few of us um, and, and I would always it, it, Jeff's one of those guys that I admire because he didn't say a lot till he needed to say a lot. And when he did, it would always change the conversation. So I admired him as he would actually direct us back to what is the real issue. And I could see in, in your presentation that you're committed to, to doing that and to working on that. I miss those days on NCQA because it was totally different than anything else that I did. There were, we had a very, um, nice group of people on there. Um, Durenberger was the one that, that <laughs> so he was, Durenberger was our ringer, center, former senator, and our member, our dinner meetings. Uh, we would sit together and talk about, and the thing, the story he told us that I liked the most was telling us about when he was kicked out of the party. Um, because, because he believed in talking on both sides of the aisle, which, um, is something that we have now, those, that was years ago. And so it, uh, it's, it's fascinating to see how this country has progressed to be even worse than, than, than at the time when he was presenting it. So anyway, I don't even know why I told you that story, but it was <laughs> 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 it's like we talking about my grandchildren. I just do it <laughs> randomly and for no reason. But, any, but I do appreciate you and what you've done. And Brenda, thank you very much for your comments. I really appreciate that. So. Um, the, the faculty and staff and learners here um, make it worth coming to work every day. I mean, we have a fantastic team, and I appreciate the, your leadership of the team. We've had several leaders in the room who've done that. You make, make this such a joy. So it's a pleasure to present this chair to you, Dr. Spess, and there's actually a chair. And as it, hidden under this, cover is an actual. Sorry, let me she break for that. Uh, I think Sam or someone in the development office called me up and said, uh, so Jeff, do you want a chair or a plaque? And I said, I need a chair. And then two days later, they called me up, mistake, it's for Dr. Spetz, not for you. <laughs> <laughs> she gets the chair, that's fine. <laughs> I saw you had an email. Have those, so we will take very good care of it.
Thank you all very, very much, and thank you all for sharing and being here tonight.